Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Antoine Godet. I'm the RI in charge of the Golf Red Window thematic project uh, located here at Laval University. Um, so I'm really pleased today to um, give you an update of uh, what we've been doing for the past months and where we are going for the next ones. Um, so we're going to be uh, different people presenting um, today. So I suggest that uh, you keep uh, your questions or or the end of the of the talks, or you put them in the chat, uh, and we're going to be pleased to pleased to answer them at the end. So obviously, this uh, project involves a lot of people, again professors from uh, different universities, um, or a postdoc, PhD students. I'm not going to name um, everyone, um, but thanks to everybody uh, to be involved in that project. Okay, so the objective of that uh, thematic project are basically to test the hypothesis of the gold, the fluids, the ligands that are involved or that are needed, needed for the formation of our genical deposit in the Spire province, or in part or entirely sourced from the large uh, metasedimentary sub provinces. And so this is what is represented on the top right part of that slide, um, where we can think about um, an hypothetical rock source. Um, that's going to um, contain a certain uh, amount of fluid, a certain amount of ligand, a certain amount of cold that could be released um, in the system. Um, <clears throat> another part of another objective of that project is define the pressure, temperature, time, chemistry, deformation, evolution of those metasedimentary provinces. So the idea is to build quantitative pity path. So you have that on the on the bottom right uh, where every um, PT pad is defined by a certain magnitude, a certain shape along a certain gradient at a certain time, prograde time um, and retrograde time. And uh, we can expect along that particular PT pad um, to release in the system some fluids, some metals, uh, including gold and uh, some ligands. And we expect that to happen in a certain PT window at a certain time. And this is what we call the Gold Fluid Window Project. So overall, the implication at the end of the, uh, at the end of the day will be we're going to have a better understanding of the, the thermal history of um, those metasedimentary sub provinces. Uh, we're going to have a better constraint on the timing of both deformation and metamorphism. Um, we're going to have a good idea on the fluid flow and the element mobility, and uh, maybe some. Um, um, some better understanding on, on why they are endowed and less endowed areas. And, and we link that to uh, the team of the, the source to sink project uh, to have a complete um, story. This is what is kind of represented there, where we can uh, imagine um, that the, the, the shape of the PT pad, the magnitude, and the gradient are directly linked to the style of, um, of tectonism. So obviously, the there are, there are some people thinking that uh, in the Archean it was different from the modern. So we can directly, my point is that we can directly link uh, those pressure temperature time path um, to a certain tectonic set. So who is doing that right now? So we are for uh, ongoing projects uh, in endowed and less endowed areas. Um, so I'm, I'm personally interested in the intrusive record of both uh, the Pontiac sub-province, located south of the ABTB, and the Quetico uh, sub-province. Um, Isaac is going to present his, uh, his uh, project in a couple of minutes, and uh, is uh, basically trying to quantify the metamorphic evolution of the Pontiac sub-province. Um, then we have Adrian, who is um, currently working on his PhD project, uh, focused on the Quetico and the metamorphic evolution of the Quetico. And we have Diogo, um, who is uh, looking at the, the mobility of those metals, sulfur and, uh, and ligands. So they're going to present right, uh, right after me. So I'm going to start by talking about the, the thermal history um, of the, the overall uh, project. So we have um, already presented that in the last uh, partner meeting. Um, but the idea was to investigate the thermal history of the northern Pontiac sub-province by looking at the granitoid. So the research questions, um, oh, sorry, I should start by looking at the map. So as you can see on the, on the map, um, 
So this is Rwanda, this is Malartic, and 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 the northern Pontiac is mainly composed of granite, um, granitoids or intrusive bodies. So in pale blue, you have the sediments, but as you can see, there are different um, granitoids intrusions um, divided um, in different chemistry. I'm going to talk about that uh, in a couple of minutes. Um, and we have that big one, which is the Dussel Batolif. There is another famous one that is the Fournier Pluton, uh, south of, um, of Malartic, and uh, some different other Plutonic uh, suites. So the questions were, um, what is the impact of the magmatic intrusion on the, on the gold fluid window? Uh, what is the timing of those intrusions? And how does it link to the tectonic metamorphic evolution of the Pontiac? Um, what type, what kind of magmatism? Um, can we better define the sources? And um, what is the proportion of magmatic volatiles inside the metamorphic background? So then I'm, I'm going to mostly focus on, on those, uh, those different questions. So in this area, there are three different uh, groups of granitoids, I would say. Um, so the first one is represented by the opacity agnes, uh, which is located south of Juan de Ronda. Uh, those are TTGs, basically, tonalite uh, diorite agnes from a juvenile oxidite source, um, plotting in, the, in, this, uh, in this area of the diagram. Then there is a main, um, main group uh, composed of different plutonic suites, but also different uh, seals and dikes. And um, they are characterized by a sanukitoid affinity and, um, and um, geochemistry. So they are derived from the juvenile uh, hydrated and oxidized source. And they also share some um, geochemical affinities uh, with the lamprophyr that were described by Adrian uh, during the master thesis um, in the Pontiac. So that's why they are uh, all grouped together. And finally, the third type are the, the S-type granites. Uh, that are represented uh, by the Dussel batolites, which is the, the main one. Um, so again, sanukitoids are all plotting in, in that area of the, of the diagram uh, and the, the S-type uh, graph. So we did uh, some new investigation and a uh, new geochron uh, approach. And um, so we were able to, to, to date for the first time the opacity agnase. Uh, and this is the DH the that we have at uh, 2764 plus or minus seven. <clears throat> so this is kind of old and um, we interpret that as the local basement um, of the Pontiac. It is uh, cross-catted uh, by uh, pink pegmatites uh, that were previously dated at 2660. Um, and those pegmatites are, are, I would say, almost everywhere in the Pontiac. And it's, it's a late, uh, S-type related um, pegmatitic uh, intrusive uh, phase. Then, so it was for the first group, the TTGs. Then we're going to move on. Um, this is, um, those are the examples from the Sanikitoid suite. Um, so some of them were previously dated. Um, so for example, this is the Lacronia Pluton, which is uh, basically a, a mozonite to mozodiorite. Um, so it was previously dated and we, we confirm, uh, we did confirm the, the age. Uh, we provide new ages from the lac Fréchette Plutonic Suite that was also previously dated. As you can see, everything seems to be around 2670 to uh, 2690. Um, so we have new ages there. Um, another example is the lac Rémini Pluton, uh, uh, sorry, the Rémini Batolit, um, which is composed of porphyric uh, monzonitic rocks, basically, um, really homogeneous, I would say. Um, and again, dated at 2680-ish. And finally, we have a new date um, from those um, sandinkitoids um, uh, affinities, uh, telsic dike uh, that are um, intruded within the metawakis and that sometimes are cross-cutted by the long profile. And we have a date at uh, 2674. So all the sandinkitoids seems to be uh, the, seems to be coeval all over the, the pond. And the third group is represented uh, mainly by the Dussel Batolif. Um, so it was previously dated um, from, 
uh, based on uh, just a couple of grains, actually two manila grains and, and seven zycon grains. So we were able to date again. Unfortunately, the zycons were metallic, so uh, they didn't provide um, useful ages or dates. But we're able to uh, date the uh, monazite. And uh, from the monazite, we are able to say that um, there is a, um, a protracted record from uh, 2670 to uh, 2620. So we have a long lived um, monazite history uh, for the De cell batteries, which is, by the way, composed of uh, uh, muscovite, uh, biotite, and, and garnet. Um, I should mention that the de cell is uh, deformed. We have uh, some evidence of deformation uh, within the de cell battery. So if we put that together and if we compare with uh, what is uh, what has been compiled in the literature uh, from the Abitibis of Provence, so this is the Pontiac over there with the, the new ages. So we have the new age from the Opacetic Agnes, um, again at 2764 which is the oldest known rocks uh, from the ABTB and the Pontiac. Um, then it is followed by and color-coded uh, in blue, um, the Sanicitoids rocks or group that are the same age than the Sanicitoids in the ABTB. And finally, we have the protracted the cell battery uh, from 2670 um, to 2620. Uh, um, so we have different type of rocks. Uh, the TTG rocks were likely sourced by metabasaltic, uh, um, um, the, the melt derived from metabasaltic source. Um, the sanicitoids are syndepositional and the, um, the source was a metasomatized mantelic source. And finally, we interpret the cell uh, batholith as deriving from the, the Pontiac uh, group sediments melting at depth. Um, so we, we clearly see an evolution in, in the type of magmatism and in the timing of magmatism. Um, if we compare that, and it's a, it's a nice compilation from Laurent et al. Um, it, it's not uh, it's not new, and it has been described in different craters around the world. Um, where you can see in, in yellow, you have the TTG that transition uh, through sanic to its like magmatism all the way to uh, a stab granite. So it has been uh, described uh, everywhere and uh, interpreted as a transition in the tectonic region. If we look locally and uh, if we compare now the magmatic record that we have um, within the Pontiac sub-province with um, the detrital record, with the metamorphic record, with the deformation record, and with the uh, mineralization record, um, so again, we can see that we have um, a thin sedimentation uh, sanicitoids at 2680, okay, and um, interlayered lamp um, Adrian's study. Um, we have that protracted record in the monazites from the Dussel Batholith uh, over a 50 million year long uh, period with apparent pulses, so crystallization pulses of monazite at 2640, 2620. And like you just uh, saw this morning with uh, Michi talks, uh, this age is getting uh, more and more attention. Um, and it's uh, comparable to uh, what Michi presented this morning and their new data on, on Xenotim ages at uh, 2645. And finally, the Dussel battery is a bit deformed. So we might have an evidence of uh, the maximum deformational age um, of um, um, so sorry, so that, that young age could represent the maximum de um, deformation age of the last uh, deformation event uh, within the Pontiac subproduct. So quite interesting to, to compare all of it together. Um, so to conclude, uh, we now have recognized uh, TTG basement south of the Abitibis of Provence. Uh, so previously, as you can see on, on that uh, more detail, uh, a figure, uh, the opatica-like uh, rocks were not recognized, but we may have a new evidence of opatica-like uh, basement source of the ABTB. Um, we have seen deposition of sanicitoid magmatism and uh, lamprophyre magmatism um, sourced by a metasomatized mantle uh, that we interpret in, 
in an extensional setting at 2680. It was followed by a long-lived aesthetic magmatism with different pulses, uh, with that 2640 that is getting attention, that we interpret in a collisional setting. And we may have maximum age of the last deformation event at 2620 uh, in the region. So the next steps uh, for me would be submit the manuscript in a couple of weeks um, and move on to the critical part of the project. Um, so we, we've targeted specific uh, intrusive rocks in the critical two uh, to, do the, um, to, to fill the gaps, uh, basically, and, and be able to compare the, the intrusive record to the metamorphic and the deformation record. Uh, so petrography is in progress, or rock chemistry is with uh, ALS currently. And uh, we've sent it the, the rocks for separation and uh, hopefully we'll do the chirp on the, in the next month. And I should also mention that uh, we plan to go on the field for field season number three and look at the paroctotonous sequences in the Greenville front. Um, so, okay, so I will stop sharing my screen and uh, Isaac, you can um, start sharing yours maybe. Just a sec. Okay. Can you, can you see my screen, right? Yep, go for it. All right, perfect. Hello everyone, my name is Isaac and uh, I'm a PhD student at the University of Laval uh, in Quebec. And today I'm gonna present some results of my project, especially focus on the new constraints on the PTTD metamorphic evolution of the Pontiac metasedimentary subprovence. My project, is supervised by Professor Carl Gilmet and is course supervised by Professors George Bedouin and Crystal Laflame. Also, we work in collaboration with other professors, researchers, and PhD students from the University of Laval and other institutions as well. The Pontex province is a near Archean terrain with a highly debated tectonal thermal evolution. Previous studies that focus on the seismic the trito, volcanic, and magmatic records have led to contrasting tectonic models in which the Pontiac was formed and involved as an accretionary prism formed close to the, the ABTB volcanic arc in a subduction setting, a plume-related rifting basin within the older ABTB arc developed between periods of short-lived subduction and finally, a rifty field basin where mantle overturn events favored the opening of an extensional basin followed by a fast reaccretion of Brimble continents. Although previous studies provide great insights into the Pontiac geodynamic evolution, less attention has been given to the metamorphic and the structural uh, history of the supracrustal rocks. Yet, those supracrustals contain widespread metapilites that can allow a detailed investigation of the tectonic thermal evolution of the continental crust during orogenesis. In our work, we use uh, the petrochronology approach, combining microstructural and microtextual relationship with phase equilibrium modeling, lutetian hafnium garnet dating and UPB monazite dating to try to solve the Pontiac's tectonic metamorphic puzzle. The Pontiac's province is mainly characterized by thick turbiditic sequence with concordant comatitic and basaltic flows, which record the maximum deposition age uh, around 2682 million years and a prograde metamorphic age around 2657 million years. Uh, the study area is located in the north part, uh, close to the, the Cadillac Lada Lake fault zone, as observed here. There are four, uh, four main studies in our, in our study area that provide insights into the structural geology, the map of metamorphic isograids, and the geochemistry of mafic ultramafic rocks, and the contact relationship with the, the metasedimentary. Uh, rocks. However, uh, the trajectory and the shape of the PTT paths across the Barovian type sequence remain poorly constrained. Also, 
there is a conflict point of view on the structural geology. Even those previous investigators report a north to south uh, Barovian type metamorph field degradant and southeast version uh, fold and trust structures. It remains unclear if the uh, whether the metamorph field degradant is continuous or disrupted by an inferred trust fault separating two naps with distinct uh, tectonic fabrics and metamorphic PTT paths. We believe these uncertainties and the scarcity of quantitative metamorphic studies may partially be responsible for controversial tectonic models of the Pontiac. So in our opinion, we cannot, um, this cannot be elucidated uh, without new approach linking the metamorphic and the structural investigations. So our first step was to remap the metamorphic isograids, trying to identify index metamorphic minerals in the metabolitic layers that characterize the Barovian type sequence. Four isograids were defined with increase of grade from north to south, passing through the garnet zone, the starlight zone, the kyanite zone, and also the silimanite zone. The silimanite zone rocks are quite different from the other zones because we are able to identify three mineral assemblages. The first one composed by starlight and cordurite that replace starlite rims as observed here and here. A second assemblage composed uh, by silimanite and cordurite with a different composition than the cordurite observed at the rims of starolite with quartz, plagioclase, biotite, humanite with some evidence of partial melting. Also, identify a third assemblage composed by quartz, plagioclase, silimanite, humanite, uh, within post-tectonic garnet uh, porphyroblasts that overprint both MEA1 and MEA2 assemblies as observed here and here. As described in previous studies, two deformation phases were recognized. So during, during D1, uh, supervertical to vertical northeast uh, trend cleavage uh, is developed uh, parallel to sub-parallel to bedding planes, according to the position of overturned F1 folds. D2 is responsible to, for overprinting D1-related structures, producing a vertical east-west uh, trend crenulation cleavage that's actually planar to the regional F2 folds. Here we have one example of the relationship between the F1 and F2 fold generation in a transposed quartz vein and the relationship between the S1 and the S2. With a better knowledge of the, the, of the deformation phases, we start to looking for clues in thin sections to link the sequence of deformation phases um, to the development of porphyroblast growth across different metamorphic zones. The S1 in thin sections mainly occur as microlintons, as observed here, separated by cleavage domains associated with the S2. The S2 progressive, progressively involves from dark seams uh, to the north part of the area to a completely transposed uh, lepidoblastic texture to the south where we cannot observe anymore the S1 in the matrix, only in the, some porphyroblasts such as starolite. The relationship between the S1 and the S2 fabrics linked to the porphyroblast growth suggests that the metamorphic uh, mineral assemblies grew after the onset of D1, continuously, uh, continuously through and after D2. We also obtain whole rock compositions from different samples uh, for different metamorphic zones that are plotted here in the AFM diagram. The lack of uh, grade related trend composition suggests that the regional distribution of the mineral assemblies in the Pontiac 
is primarily controlled by the variations on the metamorphic grade rather than whole rock compositions. We have selected four metapilite samples with low variance um, mineral assemblies that we use for the phase equilibrium model. So here we have the, the different steps we follow to retrieve the peak PT conditions from the metapilites. So first we use the whole rock geochemistry data, and then we choose the compositional system we want to modeling. Uh, from that, we are able to calculate the topology of the PT phase diagrams. Also, we have carefully described the, the thin sections to identify textual relationships between minerals and microstructures. And to calculate the, the model proportions and the isoplates, we have used the micro XRF maps and the mineral, mineral chemistry. After we finish calculating the PT diagram, as observed here, uh, the topology, the first thing to do is to check if we can reproduce the equilibrium mineral assemblage observing thin section, thin section. If so, we calculate the isomodes of the main mineral phases and the isoplates from grossular contents in garnet and anotite contents in plagioclase, which gave us a peak PT conditions uh, around seven, at around 7.5 kilobars, 680 uh, degrees. This was the the approach uh, apply for all the PT phase diagrams we calculated for the, the other metamorphic zones. We have obtained lutetium half million garnet ages for all the metamorphic zones, which is consistent with previously uh, published ages around 26, uh, 57 million years from the starolite zone rocks in the south of Aldor and Malartic. And here we have the representative lutetium maps for all the zones, where we can see our oscillatory zoning in most samples and a well-preserved growth zoning with most lutetium uh, confined in the cores, meaning that internal diffusion hasn't disturbed the system. So based on that, we interpret this garnet ages as the time of prograde metamorphism and the crustal thickening. We also perform UPB monazite dating only for the, the kyanite zone and uh, the silimanite zone, the silimanite zone because of the, the lack of monazite grains in the garnet and starolite zones. For the, the kyanite zone, monazite out is of 2657 million years, which is similar to what we obtained for lutetium half new garnet age. But for the silmanite zone, monazite see out the old age of 26, 67 million years, which represents a time span of 10 million years when compared with the prograde metamorphic age. Our results from petrochronology point toward a polymetamorphic history of the Pontiac, which we, we can divide into two distinct metamorphic events. Our first event, a first low pressure and high temperature metamorphic event recorded by 2667 million years crystallization of prograde monazite associated with the NA2 assemblage with silmanite and corderite. Also, uh, not evidence is the monazite trace uh, element contents from the silmanite zone that are less fractionated when compared with the, the kyanite zone sample, which records 26, 15, 7 million years, which means that uh, the monazite grew prior to the garnet during prograde conditions. Isobaric uh, PTTD heating path, uh, roughly estimated around 3 to 4 kilobars and 500 to 700 degrees outside the stability field of garnet is interpreted for this metamorphic event. And uh, in the absence of textual um, evidence, we could not predict a predict, uh, retrograde path for this metamorphic event. A second metamorphic overprint is recorded by prograde monazite and garnet growth. Here we, we have uh, samples from garnet to silimanite zones that records 
a clockwise PTTD paths along a Borovian like metamorph field gradient, which is well consistent with uh, crustal thickening. We interpret this continuous gradient developing uh, one coherent structural block and not in, in two naps as described by uh, previous studies. In summary, all data is consistent with a tectonal metamorphic evolution involving an early low pressure, high temperature metamorphism prior to 2657 uh, million years, possibly reflecting an extensional tectonic setting, followed by the, the baro syntectonic Barovian metamorphism, likely in response to crustal thickening upon, upon continental collision with the RBTB Subi province. We believe that this timeline of deposition poly, uh, polymetamorphism and deformation of the Pontiac, which is spans approximately 25 million years, at least contradicts, contradicts the existing uniformitarian plate tectonic model of the Pontiac uh, metasedimentary sub-province formation, pointing toward a transitional, um, a transitional regime or a stagnant lead model for the formation of the Pontiac. Thank you very much for, for your time. Thanks, Isaac. Um, yeah, so like I mentioned before, keep your question for the end. And uh, we move on to Adrian's uh, presentation um, on the Quaticus province. All right, so hi everyone. My name is Adrian Rin. I'm a PhD candidate in my second year uh, with this uh, with the Gold Flu Window team. And I'm at the at Laurentian. I'm working with uh, Doug Tinkham and uh, Carl, Carl Guimet with, uh, as my supervisors, and Antoine, of course. Um, so my uh, approach to this talk was to uh, look at, right at the composition of the Quetico Basin. Um, obviously, Isaac did a great job going over the PTTD history. Um, but another important variable when we're thinking about um, fluid generation uh, is what is the composition of the source. And so uh, you know, a lot of people like to think of the uh, Archean uh, metasedimentary metasedimentary basins as uh, just, just boring wackies, uh, but it gets a little bit more complicated than that. And in fact, we have several different um, types of lithologies that experienced um, progressive metamorphism and thus could have, um, and uh, different mineralogies, um, which ties directly to the fluid being released, uh, the type of fluid and volume and at what time the fluid is being released. So, um, the four types of uh, lithologies, that, uh, main ones that we see in the Quetico are low aluminum pelites, which are uh, classified by biotite, quartz, plage, uh, plus or minus by chloride, depending on what grade. Uh, and this makes up about 60, an estimated 60% of the Quetico as a whole. Um, high aluminum pelites, which uh, are similar to those, but contain uh, either muscovite, storolite, andalusite, cordyrite, et cetera, as one of the phases. And that makes up 30%, uh, an estimated 30% of the credit. Um, we also have a new phase or a new type of rock which uh, we've identified, which is a calcic pelite, um, which uh, is characterized by amphibole uh, and specifically hornblendic amphibole. And at lower grades, there's a little bit of epidote in these rocks as well. Um, and so these are um, appear to be uh, primary uh, calcic compositions, but also. Um, Wackies that have been metasomatized. So both are grouped into there. And then the last one are these tholeitic basalts and uh, are tholeitic basaltic rocks, chromatic basaltic rocks, you know, either flows or high level intrusions. And these are mostly characterized by amphibole and plage with garnet, titanite, alminite. We also have um, a very small percentage of the pelates are high um, potassium, so they're rich in muscovite. Um, and we also have uh, calc alkaline mafic intrusion, so lamp of fears, um, and uh, volcanic clastic rocks, and sills, which, um, which make up, you know, one to two percent of the Quetico as a whole. Uh, and so what, what we also want to look at is what, uh, if there's differences as we go across stripe, you know, from the north to the south, for instance, we want to see if that changes, if the composition changes. 
And, you know, from the mapping of the last two seasons, what we've seen is that the, the ratio of pelites um, doesn't really change. Um, it seems to be fairly consistent. But what we do see is that there is a, a change in the uh, amount of metavolcanic rocks uh, that we have in Quetico. So at the margins, you know, um, with the uh, yeah, in contact with the Wawa and the, the Wabiyun, uh, for instance, we're going to have these transitional uh, zones where you have mostly basaltic rocks. So, uh, and this this is important because what we're really looking at for the gold fluid window is um, rocks that have been metamorphosed between um, biotite in and melts in, the first uh, instance of melt. And that's because before biotite, um, all the water is going to be trapped in chlorite mostly. So biotite in is the first main reaction where fluid can be released. And then, of course, that goes up through um, garnet in, uh, storolite in, cordurite, sulmonite in. And then we get to the liquidus, or the solidus, sorry. And then that is uh, where all the melt that's, or all the water that's produced in, in that reaction is going to go straight into the resulting melt in these pegmatites. And then that goes into a different, you know, we're talking about ma magmatic um, hydrothermal systems at that point. Okay, so uh, one of the things we want, want to do is to really classify these pelites uh, based on uh, chemistry because a lot of the previous studies focus more on, uh, on the mineralogy of these compositions. But since we're going through so many different metamorphic zones, that mineralogy is always going to be changing. So we wanted to come up with a uh, um, chemist classification scheme that doesn't really, isn't affected by metamorphic grain. And so I've, um, after plotting um, um, these pelites that have uh, aluminous minerals versus pelites that have just garnet or, or chloride, and then these calcic pelites, we, we see that there's a, an arbitrary um, boundary at the ASI or aluminum, uh, aluminum saturation index at about 1.5. Um, so over that, we're going to start developing, you know, these aluminous, aluminous minerals. Uh, we also, once, you know, an arbitrary boundary at about one um, uh, potassium to sodium, uh, ratio over that was where we're going to get a lot of what are high K pelites or muscovite rich pelites. And then you can see on the right diagram for the, you know, the calcic pelites, um, these do plot within um, this, this calcic field, um, which is used to classify granitoid rocks by frost, I believe 2008. Um, moving over to the AFM and AFC diagrams, these are metamorphic trinity diagrams, um, which have the Compositions of, of probe, microprobe data for you know these uh, important minerals, uh, including storolite, cordierite, uh, pinnatized cordierite, uh, chlorite, garnet, biotite, and hornblende. Um, and what we can see from this is that the um, iron to magnesium ratio is you know, is generally pretty consistent at zero point four five, as well as all of the um, the minerals appear to be plot close to that that whole rock valley, uh, especially biotite, hornblende, chlorite. You know, these are all kind of shifted towards that uh, overall magnesium number, and I'll talk a bit about that after. But, but calcium, on the other hand, as we can see on this, this AFC plot on the right, uh, appears to be pretty well um, well preserved in the partitioning, especially you see it in garnet um, is uh, is well preserved. Uh, all the way from low calcium to high calcium. And we can also see that the, horn, the amphibole values that we got from pelites are plot well within the horn blend range. And so one other thing that we wanted to do with the, the mineral probe data or microprobe data is to look at the zoning, uh, to quantify the zoning in, the, in garnets, because these record uh, prograde growth better than almost any other mineral. Um, and so we, we have a uh, uh, micro XRF map or a uh, probe map of the uh, of a calcic pelite or garnet, and we have the iron um, end member, the magnesium end member, and the calcium end member plot on the right. And what we are seeing with a lot of these garnets is that there's a, a major diffusional exchange uh, that appears to be happening with biotite. Um, not only sometimes it's just at the rims, like as we can see in that one, or it can be the entire garnet is just completely diffused 
um, by this, uh, this diffusional exchange with biotin. This is something that has been described a lot in these Archean metasedimentary rocks. Um, the magnesium zoning, which is uh, typically shows a, a bell curve shape or a bell shape, I should say, um, appears to preserve a lot, some of that, but there, there is, a, it is a bit flattened. Um, so maybe a bit of diffusion of is also is also happening with biotite. But the calcium is great because uh, it doesn't it doesn't show any evidence of diffusion really. Um, and we can see a really interesting pattern in, in one of these calcic phyllites where we have a, a moderately high calcic core and an enriched mantle, and then a very depleted um, rim uh, in calcium. So this really um, just from that diet from that map there, we can see that that's that's growth zoning likely within the uh, the garnet zone or within the within the garnet. So this probably reflects um, partitioning between these calcic phases. And so uh, we're going to have to investigate that a bit more uh, and then plot those on phase equilibria um, models or pseudosections to see, uh, yeah, to really be able to quantify this, the partitioning and understand the timing of these, uh, these events because calcium is really is going to be the key. And then just one quick slide on the volatile content. Um, the, with ALS, we measured uh, H2O plus, which is basically um, measured with uh, uh, in, infraspectrometry inf or something as such. And it's basically thought to measure the, the structurally bounded H2O. And that's always going to be lower than the LOI value. So that's what I show on the, the left bar diagram there as that. Uh, for the different pelites and the, the basaltic rock, we have a pretty consistent H2O uh, content. And I didn't show how this is affected by metamorphic grade, but um, there is a slight decrease, maybe about 1% as you go up grade um, in the selenite zone and melt zone. Um, so sulfur and carbon are generally pretty low, so well, usually one, less than 1% for both. Uh, and for these, yeah, for these two elements, there's no apparent change with uh, increasing metamorphic grade. Um, and so you can see there's a little bit more carbon actually in the in the basaltic rocks, um, based on only a couple of analysis. But this is kind of important to think about because obviously for orogenic gold systems, um, you expect to have some carbon involved in that. So since it's so low in the meta sediments, um, you know maybe we have to look at a different different source for that. Okay, so uh, to summarize, uh, we have four potential source topologies, um, likely in the Quetico. Um, these control, probably directly control the metamorphic fluid releasing uh, reactions. And uh, the, the volatile content appears to be broadly similar, although I think we need more detail, or more samples to confirm that. And we're going to be getting lots of samples with Diogo and, and my ALS work. Uh, we see a Cross strike variability within the Quetico basin, mostly just on the amount of metabasalt. Uh, the long strike variability, I didn't really mention it, but there doesn't appear to be much variation um, uh, in terms of the, the protoliths. Uh, there's tried to develop, well, we are de currently developing a new characterization, characterization scheme for, for these pelates, just based on these uh, important elements aluminum, calcium, potassium, and sodium. And then I mentioned how important. Calcium partitioning is going to be key um, for understanding understanding the prograde path, um, and part of that is going to be uh, applying that to phase equilibrium modeling. And I've shown uh, kind of an example of a of a pseudo section on the right, which is a work in progress here. And then, of course, we're going to want to be able to tie in the the absolute dates that we can get um, with uh, geochronology on garnet and monazite. And uh, yeah, that's all I have. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Adrian. Good for um, Last but not least, Diego, are you there? The, yes. Yeah, okay, go for it. Okay, okay so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Diogo Ribeiro. I'm a PhD candidate uh, in uh, uh, Naval, uh, Laval University. I'm supervised by uh, Bertrand Rotier and Georges Bedouin. And my project is related to uh, element mobility uh, in the metasedimentary belts from the, uh, the Superior Province. And the main goal is to address uh, how uh, the Quetico and the Pontiac may, may have been uh, suitable sources of fluid uh, ligands, uh, such as sulfide and chlorine, 
and metals, uh, especially gold, uh, for the formation of orogenic coal deposits in the uh, superior craton. Uh, for that, I'm going to track uh, element mobility during uh, prograde metamorphism. Uh, last year, Pete Carney and others did that in the Ponia, uh, something uh, uh, of the sort, and they uh, observed a systematic degree of uh, gold, arsenic, and antimony uh, with increasing uh, metamorphic rates from chloride zone to the silimonite zone. And they concluded that gold was mobilized during prograde metamorphism. Uh, however, there are some things missing, such as the constraint of PT conditions. Here, the, the samples are sorted by metamorphic rate, not by uh, temperature, for example. Uh, uh, regarding also the, the key metamorphic reactions that control the liberation of the fluids and what is the composition of those fluids and also uh, tracking uh, element mobility at uh, mineral scale. So uh, to track the, the mobility of uh, elements uh, during prograde metamorphism, I'm going to use whole rock geochemistry data and ultra low detection limit analysis for gold, which are also whole rock and combine that with in situ analysis uh, on the morphic minerals across different metamorphic conditions. And that will also be in, uh, combined with the PT constraints obtained for the Pontiac and the Quetico uh, from Isaac uh, and Adrian. And the ultimate goal is to establish the optimal PT conditions for the release of uh, gold bearing fluids, uh, a gold fluid window. Uh, so, this study, uh, it will be focused on three areas. Uh, Juan Ojanda in the Pontiac, which is considered to be an endowed area. Uh, Geraldton in the Quetico, which is considered to be a moderately endowed area. And Thunder Bay, which is considered to be barren, also in the Quetico. So we went on the field uh, over the last summer and, and we collected samples from Greywack to Peelite. Uh, and also uh, a lot of mafic rocks and also some rocks, um, some calcic pilites that uh, Adrian mentioned. And uh, the sampling uh, tried to have the best representativity for metamorphic zones and different protolits uh, and also a, a good spatial representativity of the three areas. And in these pictures, you can see uh, in green the, the samples that I selected for uh, the ultra low uh, detection limit analysis for gold. So uh, the best spatial representativity possible across the, the whole metamorphic uh, zones. Um, instead of using the traditional method, which was developed by Pitcar and others in 2006, uh, which involves a lot of uh, multiple acid digestion of the samples and then chromatographic separation and analysis with ICPMS. We're gonna try a new method, uh, which is uh, to perform laser ablation in uh, pressed powder pellets. So basically it's the, the powder, the rock powder that was uh, nanomilled. So it was milled again in a process called nanomill. Uh, and then the, the powder is pressed into pellets and then blasted with uh, laser ablation. So, uh, I started a, a long uh, sample preparation procedure uh, he, uh, here in Canada. And then from January to March, I went to Germany to KIT, KIT uh, to collaborate with Clifford Patton and uh, Johann Kolb uh, to perform the uh, gold analysis in powder, uh, powder pressed powder pellets. So I did some nano milling, which is a wet milling. Uh, I already had the powders that I brought with me. Uh, and after this uh, wet milling, this is the result. So on the left, it's, uh, there's a powder which was milled normally. And after the nano milling, uh, we get a much finer granularity. And the goal of this is to avoid um, nugget effects while blasting the sample. Um, and to have like a representative uh, section of the sample within the spot size that we defined for the laser revelation. So uh, this powder is usually 60% of the grains were uh, below two micron, 95% below five micron and some rare class would appear, but they were 
basically a very fine grain. And then they were pressed into pellets and the acquisition, the, the conditions, the analytical conditions are still being tweaked a bit. We're still testing, uh, but we do uh, four, four spots, uh, four shots per, per, per sample, per pellet to ensure that they're homogeneous. And the spot size will be uh, something uh, around uh, 150 microns, so much bigger than the granularity of these powders. Uh, we did do a test uh, laser session. Um, however, we don't have the internal standard values. Uh, we're going to use the whole rock geochemistry data, and uh, I don't have that yet. And the background is still uh, quite high. Uh, we're getting a detection limit around uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 ppb, and we think we can uh, lower it to 0 0.1 uh, ppb, which would be within the range, the minimum range, the minimum uh, value. Uh, for the, the, the study from Pitcairn and others uh, from last year. But here on the, the, the test we did, the absolute values uh, are meaningless because we don't have the internal standard, but uh, the trend seems to mimic uh, to some extent the, the trends obtained by Pitcairn and others uh, for the Pontiac. These are also samples from the Pontiac and the red crosses are the mean values for each uh, metamorphic zone. So next, uh, I will I will note the cliff of cliff of pattern in KIT will acquire the ultra low detection limit analysis for gold uh, later this month, and uh, I'll start doing the petrography and uh, in situ analysis in metamorphic minerals and sulfites for the samples that I selected for uh, the gold analysis. Thanks. So I hope we gave you a good uh, overview of the Goldfield Window project uh, ongoing. And uh, if you have any questions, we are happy to answer them. Um, I would have a question or a comment, maybe more for uh, Adrian and uh, <clears throat> Isaac is that uh, I think the uh, mythic rock seems to be holding more water than the sediments at their current metamorphic level anyway, uh, which is um, perhaps not unexpected, but not too widely realized. Um, the question would be how much there was in these volcanic rocks before they were, were undergoing metamorphism. Although they're not so abundant, I don't know if it would have an impact on the mass balance calculation of the uh, water input. What do you think? Uh, I can explain better, Professor, because I, I didn't work much with the Mafic and Tramafic rod, so I, I think he has a better knowledge too. Yeah, yeah, I think um, what I showed there, the uh, H2O values around, I think it was around three, um, between three and four percent is, these are pr pretty low grade, actually. These are chlorite and biotite zone um, mafix. So that's probably a good estimate of what the what those contained before uh, before getting up, you know, to medium grades. Um, but I also avoided picking like messed up veiny samples, right? Too. So it could even be higher with that actually, because uh, if you have uh, you know mafic volcanics that have been you know altered, uh, you know, syn syn genetically, then maybe the the H two O and carbon is even higher in those. Um, so I would think that's kind of the, the lower limit at what, uh, what the, their volatile content that I showed there. What, what would you say about the uh, ratio content of the uh, metasedimentary rocks at the lower end of the metamorphic spectrum? So, sorry, the... Uh, the uh, water content at the uh, low grade metamorphic, in the low grade metasedimentary rocks. Yeah. Um, yeah, like what I showed there included chloride zone, a couple of chloride zone samples. I think I, I need to, well, I'm getting back a couple more of those uh, of those analyses. Um, so I'll be, I'll be able to answer that a bit better later. But uh, I think, yeah, we're looking at two to three percent of, uh, well, maybe maybe four percent within a chloride zone wacky. And the sulfur and, and carbon is still going to be pretty low, I think, in those two, less than one percent. 
Okay, thank you. I have a question. Um, no one mentioned tourmaline in any of these um, sedimentary rock assemblages. Um, tourmaline is a common mineral in the gold deposits. So um, is it possible that the boron is coming out of the sediments? If not, where's the boron coming from? Yeah, most of the samples, oh, sorry, Adrian. Most of the samples from all the metamorphic zones, we, we identify uh, tourmaline, in my case, in the Pontiac. But I don't know if Adrian could identify as well in the in quite yeah. cool. Yeah, almost almost every sample contained a grain or two of tourmaline. So I think that it's, yeah, it's a pretty good uh, um, interpretation that, if, that the boron's coming from those, from the wackies and... No one's looking at boron isotopes. Well, boron isotopes in the veins, in the tourmaline vein, indicate a crustal source. So typically it's a little bit, um, well, it's varied um, and it's fractionated to some degree. So it has a uh, partly a granitic ancestor. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so it's mostly uh, granitic and felt crustal sources for the boron. Um, but did we measure the boron content in the rock, Adrian or Isaac? No, we don't have uh, boron. No, we don't have. Yeah. And you need her, uh, Hugo? I don't think so. Eh? I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just a comment on the on the boron. <clears throat> of course, boron can be in the clays, and and so if you're you're getting seawater boron into the clays, and then when you metamorphose it, you can you can release the boron that way, and it doesn't necessarily have to be tourmaline. It it can be coming from the from the white micas. Well, I think it's a really good point, and we'll try to track boron, whether as modal proportions of tourmaline across uh, metamorphic gradients or uh, through whole rock analysis, something we hadn't paid attention to. Really good point. Thanks. I think, uh, it's Ross here, I think, you know, empirically, you know, when you get into, you know, across the, the protozoic rocks into Ontario, there's no tourmaline in those quartz veins, very, very little and you don't have the Pontiac down to the south. So I think it's an empirical relationship that, that bears paying attention to. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, I, I've got one. Is, is uh, anyone has attempted to do some kind of mass balance calculation in, in the sense of looking how much gold there is in the sediment and seeing if there is, what would be the catchment, um, um, what would be the volume needed of sedimentary rock to produce the, the gold deposit that we see along the larger Lake Cadillac formation zone? Yes, yes, that's, that's one of the objectives. When we uh, finally get a fluid composition, ideal fluid com composition, based on the amount of uh, volume of rocks, of that specific rocks, we'll try to calculate how much would be needed to match that endowment. Okay, so that's one of the goals of the project. Yes. Okay. Uh, the, in the Pitcairn paper, there's a first order approximation. And uh, we come to the conclusion that about uh, the volume of gold that was released, it's a rough estimate, estimate but it's 10 times what would be needed to for the whole Valdor camp. Mm. Okay. 